Bibles and turn with me to Luke's Gospel, the fifth chapter, beginning with chap with verse one. So uh, we don't have to go too far. Don't worry if you don't know where it is. It's in the beginning of the New Testament. But let me see your Bibles. Hold them up. All right. I'm glad to see some Bibles. I and make sure that you get yourself a Bible. We'll have uh, some more Bibles available for purchase next week in case uh, you need to get a Bible there. But we again, Luke's Gospel, the fifth chapter. And today's sermon is on my reflections of some life lessons that I've learned after nine years of ministry. All right, beginning with verse 1. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy word. So today's sermon is a little bit different than I normally give my sermons, but I'm going to give you my top 10 lists of things that I have learned in ministry. And these are life lessons that I believe can be applied to each and every one of us. And I wanted to start with the Gospel of Luke. I wanted to start with this passage because here we have people that are just going about their ordinary lives and Jesus interrupts their ordinary lives with something very extraordinary. He gets into their boat. And I think most of us can maybe relate to Jesus getting in the boat of our lives. Jesus doesn't necessarily ask to get in the boat. He demands to get in the boat. He demands preeminence in our lives. And Jesus gets into the boat of our lives. There's teaching that goes on. And then we see within this passage that they had already worked themselves into a fit. They've already worked all night. Jesus tells them to go out into the deep water and to put down their nets. Now, Jesus is a carpenter. He's not a fisherman. And he's telling the fishermen on what to do with their lives. And the fishermen go, okay, well, since you've got some good teaching and since we've listened to you, we'll go ahead and we'll kind of do what you want us to do. How many of us have had that kind of cavalier attitude with Jesus? Like, okay, I'll give this a little bit of a try, but it's really not going to work. And so they go out there, and what is the result is that they caught so many fish that the boats were beginning to sink. It was overwhelming to them when they saw what God was doing. And it was so overwhelming to the point that these people left their jobs with reckless abandonment. They left their lives behind, and they went to go follow after Jesus. And my friends, we are called out into the deep waters as well. We're called out to go into the boat of faith, go out into the boat with Jesus into the deep waters and see the harvest that he will bring about through our simple obedience and God's great faithfulness. Amen? See, we always look at the situation and we go, that won't work, that can't work, oh, it's too hard. But there is not a situation that is too hard for a God who created the world in six days and did it just by his words. 
And we have to understand that that same God who spoke into nothing and created something wants to speak into our lives to create something that is beautiful. So life lesson number one, don't tell God no. I have told God no so many times, and every time I tell God no, he doesn't argue with me. He just makes it so that I have to do what he told me to do in the first place. Anybody there with me? I mean, I try to have some real rational arguments with God and try to rationalize with the Almighty, but the Bible tells me that my wisdom is regarded as foolishness to God. So my wisdom can't even compete with the foolishness that God if he had any foolishness, it wouldn't even be able to compete with that. But I told God I was not coming back to Bridgeton. Here I am. I told God I was not going to be a pastor. Here I am. I told God I was not going to lead a congregation out of a denomination. Here we are. And I told God I'm only giving you five years. Well, actually, the first time was a two-week pulpit supply. And here we are nine years later. Time and time again, I have had the audacity to tell the Almighty what I would or wouldn't do. In fact, I told God I will go anywhere. See, I didn't have the, the gumption that Holly had. I said, I'll go anywhere, but I want a queen-size mattress, I want air conditioning, and I prefer cable television. And God sent me to Africa, and then God sent me to our streets, and God sent me to work with the homeless and do all these things. And I'm a germaphobe. I don't like germs. I don't like getting dirty. I need my sleep, and I don't really like working all that much. I mean, these hands are softer than the day I was born, okay? So, but what we see in Proverbs 16, 9 is that in our hearts, we are always planning out our steps but who is it that guides our steps, who establishes our steps? It's the Lord that establishes our steps. And one of the things that I've learned is that, okay, and I've, I've mentioned this quote before, Nancy liked this quote from Bon Jovi, go ahead and map out your future, but do it in pencil, okay? It's okay to have some dreams and ideas about your future, but the Bible tells us that we are to delight ourselves in the Lord, and as we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. Many times we don't know what the desires of our heart really is. We don't know what they are. We sit there and we think that this will make us happy and this will make us happy. You know what I've come to understand what is the true desire of the follower's heart? The true desire of the follower's heart is Jesus. That's the true desire. So wherever Jesus leads us, whatever Jesus calls us to do, as long as he's with us, he gives us the desire of our heart when the desire of our heart is more of him. So God will give us more of him as we ask and seek more of him. He tells us, seek me and you will find me. And that, by the way, in that passage is in that Jeremiah passage where 29, 11, where we always talk about, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, and they're good plans and all that stuff. And we go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the passage is in a context. And the context is this. God has a good plan for your life, but he says, but you need to seek after me. And you need to seek me with all of your heart. Not with part of it, and we kind of dangle our feet in the water's edge of faith, right? We do a little bit here and there, but very few of us actually have the ability, or we all have the ability, very few of us have the willingness to jump in into that ocean of faith and go into the deep waters there. So you can try to tell God no, but here's what's going to end up happening. God may not push you into it. And in fact, that is actually the scariest thing because God may let you just have your way. And then you will live in an area of mediocrity in your life. If God actually did walk away from us, if God actually did listen to us when we whined, imagine what we would not be able to see in our lives. Imagine these disciples. Had they not been willing to leave their nets, they would have not been able to see the feeding of the 5,000. They would not have been able to witness the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They would not have seen the ascension of Christ, the, 
the Pentecost and the Spirit coming upon them. They would not have seen all these things, but it required them first to say yes and to leave their nets. So don't say no to God. Number two, God does give you more than you can handle. One of the things that I cannot stand that people say is God doesn't give you anything more than you can handle. And they normally say it with that little Christian smile, it doesn't give you anything more than you can handle. Bless your heart. Yes, he does. Because God wants to throw you into the deep water, he gives you more than you can handle so you understand that you are nothing apart from him. He gives you more than you can handle on your own. He gives you more than you can handle, but in him you can handle all that comes your way. In Christ we are fully sufficient. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. But until he gets us to the point of weakness, we will never understand how dependent we are upon him. And so he has to constantly war against the pride in our lives. That, the Bible actually says that God opposes the proud. So therefore, he is at war with our prideful arrogance of thinking that we could actually make it on our own without him. And so what he actually ends up doing is allowing us to go into the deep water without him so that we will then finally ask for his hand that we will finally ask for the help that we need. The Apostle Paul recognizes in 2 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul says in this passage that he was given revelations that were so great that it would almost make him boastful and proud if he let it. So what God did to keep him from being boastful and proud is he gave him a thorn in the flesh. Now what Paul did is what we all do when we have a thorn in the flesh, right? Lord, take it away. Get it out of my life. And we'll pray. And we'll fast. We'll call prayer partners. We will commit ourselves to reading a Bible passage every day. And we will do like 20 Holy Ghost squats as we get down and pray. I mean, we will do everything to get rid of that thorn. And Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, had the thorn in the flesh that was left there. And God said, it is left there. Why? So that you will learn that my grace is sufficient for you. And my power is made perfect in your weakness. So my friends, God does give us more than we can handle. But he never gives us more than we can handle with him. In him. Through him. And for him. Number three. So don't use that line anymore. All right. Number three. There is a difference between being religious and following Jesus. I grew up in church all my life. I Now, I cannot tell you the books of the Bible in order. If you can do that, more power to you. But I cannot do that without singing a little song, and I know none of you want me to sing that song to you. I never had perfect attendance in Sunday school growing up, though I did watch the people with all their Sunday school pins. I was never one of those people. But... I was one of those religious kids. I was God boy in high school, okay? I was that kid who had the Bible track and all that stuff and would hand it out and wanted to make sure that everybody was saved and this and that. And you know what? I thought that I knew all the right stuff. I even served, I was a deacon at age 23, vice chairman of the deacon board age 24. I did all that stuff. And you know, the apostle Paul, he talked about his religious credentials. He said he was the Pharisee of Pharisees and he went to go, go to the best schools and all that stuff. And yet he regards it as nothing compared to knowing Christ. And see, that's the thing. There is a real difference about knowing about Christ and knowing Christ. The only way you come to know about Christ is by taking what you learn here and going into the Word of God, wrestling out your salvation and working it out with fear and trembling and actually doing something with that faith. See, it's one thing to come in here, but James says, don't fool yourself into thinking that it's just a matter of listening or reading the Word of God. It is a matter of doing the Word of God. 
And those people who do the word of God are the followers of Jesus. Jesus called people to follow after him. And in order to follow after him, what are we called to do? We are called to deny ourselves daily. We are called to take up our cross. And we're told to go immediately. How many of us would respond with immediacy to Jesus' call? He is calling each and every one of us today. Are we going to respond immediately? Or do, does God need to beat us over the head with the realities of this life before we will finally come to understand what he wants for each and every one of us? Amen? Now, the fourth thing, following Jesus is costly. It will cost us everything. That's what the Bible actually says. You know, we, we sit there and we have like these Christianese sayings and, and this kind of fake teaching that it's just come down the aisle, get your little Jesus card so you can have your little salvation and go home and live just the way that you want to live. Jesus does not define the Christian faith in that way. He defines the Christian faith as costing us everything. It is the pearl of great price that we should be willing to lay aside everything to buy that pearl of great price. This is what it tells us in Matthew 10, 34. Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. What does he mean by a sword? He means he's come to bring division. He's come to turn households upside down, churches upside down. The world has been turned upside down by Jesus and continues to be turned upside down. And just when you think that you have Jesus in the box that you think you can understand it, get ready, my friends, because if you're walking with him, he's about to blow that box apart. Continually, day by day, I am humbled by the fact that I do not know nearly as much as I thought that I knew. I do not know it, and I have to sit there and trust in God. Trust in God. Lean not on your own understanding, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and then he will direct your path. He's not saying to figure him out. Stop trying to figure him out. How many of us spend our prayer life trying to figure God out? How many of us are, have spent lifetimes trying to figure him out? Our little bitty brains cannot handle the awesomeness of our God. So all you're going to get is a headache and not a revelation because the revelations that we get are not through our reasoning, but they are through faith. The revelations that we get are a gift from God. And God gives us those revelations when we are able to handle them. Five. People may like the idea of change, but seldom do they embrace it. Now, you've heard me say this, that as a pastor in nine years, this is what I've heard time and time again. Pastor, that won't work. And pastor, that is not how we've always done it. Well, I'm going to, Ruth Ann was actually one of the first people that said, Pastor, that's not the way we've always done it. I think it was over a church Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, she said that to me. And Ruth Ann is one of the sweetest, nicest people. I've known her since I was in high school. And she said that in a very sweet voice, Pastor, that is not how we've always done it. And I said, Ruth Ann, let me tell you something. When I was growing up, when I was a baby, I used to take a poo in a diaper. And then my mom showed me the toilet. Now, at first she had to probably coax me to the toilet by saying, if you make a poopy in the toilet, you can have a cookie. Right? We all need a cookie to make that poopy. All right. So, yes, I said poopy. Deal with it. Okay? So, but she got me into the toilet. And now I realize I don't have to walk around with a poopy pee-pee diaper. I get to remain fresh and clean all the day long. Change was good, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, maybe some of you are walking around with those diapers on today. I don't want to make a judgment call. But for those of you who have given up the pens, or maybe you've gone back to the pens and you missed the days when you didn't have the pens, because it all depends, okay? But change is good, but you know what? I didn't, when I was being, when you're toilet training a kid, do they want to do it? 
No, that's why you have to try to coax them with a cookie, but you know that it'll be better for them at the end. Okay, so that's the first thing. And then the other thing is where we always go, well, that won't work. That won't work. Why do, why do we say that won't work? Because we're looking with our physical eyes and we're not looking with spiritual eyes. And this is what it tells us in Isaiah 43, 19. See, I am doing a new thing. Everybody say new thing. God's doing something new. It springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. God is taking those areas of our lives which we go, that is impossible. And what, did, what are we told in the New Testament? What is impossible with man is possible with God. And God is able to do mighty things, but he wants us to believe that he can do mighty things. And if we want to believe that he can do mighty things, what must we do? We must step out in that belief. That's the only way. It doesn't, we tried everything here as a church to grow, right? I mean, we tried to be like every other church. We did the committee structure. I lost more hair out of that. We, we did all the Sunday school and the VBS. I mean, this is, right? This is the way we go to church. This is the way we go to church. We all had that thing. We tried everything. And then it wasn't until, right, we started stepping out, stepping out of the four walls of the church and stepping out that all of a sudden God started moving among us because he was saying, I want to do a new thing. I don't want to go back to the old. It never goes back to the way that it used to be. But God is doing a new thing, and we shouldn't be afraid of that new thing. So people may like the idea of that, wanting that change and that growth and say, nice sermon, pastor. But at the end of the day, when the rubber hits the road, will they have the ability to go all the way? Now, this leads into it. People will let you down. We will let you down. I will let you down. We all let one another down. I let myself down daily. Anybody else in there with you? I mean, daily I wake up and I'm going to be super Christian today. I will be filled with all the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, all those things. And then I walk out the door and I, lose, I left my fruit at home. Anybody ever leave your fruit at home? I leave my fruit at home daily. And I let myself down. So if I let myself down, are other people going to let me down, right? They're going to let you down. And, but you know what? Here's the thing. We don't give up on them. And we don't give up doing what God has told us to do. The Bible actually tells us to have no expectation, but to have that God is glorified. That's the only expectation that we need to have. What does it tell us in John 2, 24? Jesus didn't trust them, that is the people around him, because he knew human nature. He knew that the flesh is weak, and the spirit may be willing, but we listen to that flesh, don't we? Right? And we stroke our flesh. We love our flesh. Right? What would you like, flesh? You want a second helping? Sure. I may be full, but I will listen to you. Right? Okay, we, we listen to our flesh and we stroke our flesh and we love our flesh there. But here's the thing, we're going to let one another down. And that's just a fact of life. It will happen. Get over it. And that doesn't, that should not stop us from continuing to press on. That shouldn't stop us from doing what we believe God puts on our heart to do. And you know what? Even if we fail, let's fail doing great and mighty things rather than failing by puttering out on the wayside, right? I mean, there's plenty of people that they're failing life just by sitting there. I want to fail life by going out there and trying to change the world. And if I fail, at least you'll say, he tried. Most of us will sit there and we're spending the days on the lazy boy. Yeah, that's a whole nother sermon. Okay. Okay. Number seven, people will, quote unquote, and I use my air quotes there, take advantage of you. Now, this is what it says in Philippians 2, 3 through 4, the message translation. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. In this passage, Paul tells us that we are to have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Now, to the world's vantage point, 
Jesus was a huge sucker and continues to be a huge sucker. I mean, think about it. This man came to the people that were his own and they rejected him. This man allowed the people closest to him to deny him, to betray him. And then he allowed the people that he came to save to crucify him. By every definition that this world has to offer, Jesus was a sucker. But that is only taking into account the events leading up to Friday and leaving it not remembering what then happens on Sunday. You see, if we have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, we understand this. God has the final say. That everything that I have belongs to him. Everything that I am belongs to him and is because of him. And any significance and any difference that my life has to offer is because of him. Therefore, if God, who was able to resurrect Jesus from the dead, God, who was able to speak the world in creation by words in six days, if God could take a baby and bring it forth from a virgin, bring water from a rock and bread from the sky, God can do anything with anyone at any time. And so I use the word air quotes because there is no way that this world can take advantage of a child of God. There's no way. They cannot take away what God has already allowed them to take away. See, if we would start understanding, myself including, included, if we would start understanding every circumstance that is coming our way as coming from God, might that change our perspective on the things that we're complaining about? on the people that we're complaining about, on the feelings that, on the hurt feelings that we have. Rather than sitting there saying, God, make this go away. What should we pray? God, use me. God, mold me. God, change me. God, make it so that I recognize this. This is what I always hear in my prayers. I've never heard the audible voice, but this is what is spoken to my spirit. It's you and me, kid. It's you and me. It's me and God because in the final analysis, after all of us are gone, after all the sermons have been preached, after all the soup has been dished out, after all the homeless cots are put away, after all this stuff is done and all the degrees are put in a file because I've passed on, what remains? It's you and me, kid. That's the one thing that remains. And so why? That's where Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but instead store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. We need to have an eternal focus, an eternal mindset that is beyond this temporary body, beyond the temporary pain and disappointment and heartache. And recognize Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that he is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the creator. And everything is found in him. Everything finds its fulfillment in him. Number eight, God is responsible to do what he says he will do. You know what? When we first came here, um, I think there was like three, th when I first came here, maybe like two or three thousand dollars in the bank account. I remember preaching one Sunday with like 12 people out here uh, with an overcoat on because someone had siphoned out the oil out of our tank and we didn't have the money to necessarily put the oil back in the tank. And it was pretty cold that Sunday. And I go, Lord, you brought me to this place. I didn't want to be a pastor and now I can't even get heat. And these people don't want to do anything because they're just looking at me. The first Sunday I came here, no one even said, and today we'd like to welcome Pastor Robin Weinstein to the pulpit. It was just like, there's the pulpit, go on up. <laughs> right? Right? Those people there, I, know, I actually got up here and I said, I'd like to welcome you to Bethany Presbyterian Church, and I'm welcoming myself as well. <laughs> Thank you for joining me here. But God has been faithful. He's always been faithful. Always, from generation to generation, every day proclaims his great faithfulness, we see. And you know what? We just sit there and we forget how faithful God has been to us, don't we? We take it for granted. 
And the Bible tells us that we shouldn't take it for granted, but that is a reason to thank him and to praise him and to recognize, look what God has done. I always say that this is the island of misfit toys, and I am the chief misfit here. But look what God has done through this little island of misfit toys. Look what he continues to do. And some of you say, well, I'm no misfit. Well, there's a church out there that'll tell you you're perfect. Go find them. Because <laughs> you'll just make the rest of us feel bad. Right? But we're misfits. That's the wonderful thing. God doesn't choose the strong things. He doesn't choose the wise things. He chooses the weak things. He chooses the things that this world would throw away to show not what I can do, not what you can do, but what only God can do. I remember, and Kathy always says it too, I, my, one of my lines, you know, Kathy, Kathy's one of the numbers people. She's looking at the numbers. And, what, you know, the annual budget meeting, right, you know, looking at the numbers, and they need to add up. And for so long, they didn't add up. And now they still don't add up, but they don't add up on the other side. And we're like, what's going on here? And I used to always say, God will provide the money. God will provide the resources. And he always has. And why are we shocked when he shows up? Right? We're always like, wow, that really worked. God says, go ahead. Test me and try me. See if you don't give, offer me the first fruit. See if you don't give me the first in your life. And I will not open up the storehouses of heaven. See, she's shouting over there. She's saying this is some good stuff. Amen. Let's give her a little help. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. There you go. Out of the mouth of babes there. God is responsible. This is Philippians 1.6, the New Living Translation. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it finally is finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. We're always looking at our time schedule. All right, God, I want you to show up now. My friends, God is not working on our time schedule, and he is not working on our agenda. We need to make sure we're on his agenda, and we're operating in his time schedule. And the only way that we get to do that is by abiding in him. You ready for number nine? We're, uh, everybody's like, lunch is coming. <laughs> number nine, your motives matter. Motives matter. Proverbs 21, 2, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. This is one of the things that God continually has to remind me. Why are you doing what you're doing? Especially when I get, you know, there's recognition and all that stuff. Don't seek after men's approval. The Apostle Paul says, if you seek after men's approval, we can't be an apostle of the Lord. We can't be a follower of Jesus if we're seeking after men's approval. And so what God is doing is he wants to know that we're doing the right things because of a right heart, of a heart that is inclined to serve him, that is inclined to give him the glory. Imagine how many times, oh, everybody say hallelujah again. Amen. Imagine how many times it might change our perspective of things if we were just simply abdicate the glory entirely to God. Imagine if our lives, we just said, you know what? I don't need any glory. How many times, you know, I gave you guys a hard time because I wanted pastor appreciation, didn't I? I announced it up here. It's pastor appreciation month. I did everything but like put a bumper sticker on my car, pastor appreciation month. But at the end of the day, we should be able to do things without any of that. Now, that isn't to give us an excuse not to show appreciation to one another, because the Bible also says that. Show appreciation, build one another up. You, you, you women, you talk about it too, right? Your husbands never give you the appreciation. I hear you. They never give you the appreciation that you deserve and everything. So you have to tell them what you want, and then when they give you what you want, you're like, well, I don't want it now, because I wanted you to want to know what I wanted. And the man's going... What? I bought you flowers. How did I mess up? But my friends, we should, be, we should be encouraging one another, building one another up, but we need to make sure that our motives are aimed at making sure that God gets the glory. 
And my last thing is, and before I get to this last slide, I have never, I don't think that I've cried so much as when I've been a pastor. I mean, I think that there's a, every day I am tempted to quit. Every day I'm tempted to walk away. Every day you make me want to pull my hair out, but I don't have any. <laughs> every day there's all these different things. And I go, Lord, Lord, I just wouldn't be done. And I cry and I go, it hurts so much. It hurts because you care so much. I think there's a Winnie the Pooh thing that it only hurts because you care so much. And you watch people come in and you watch people go out. You watch people just fumble through life. You watch people who think that they got it all together and they don't have anything together. And you watch it and you can't do anything because they're not ready to hear it. They don't want to hear it. And it hurts. You, and then people betray you. People walk away from you. The very people that you have to sit there and write birthday cards to. And that when they're sick, you have to go to their bedside. Or, and, and you know they're talking about you. And you still have to be... I mean, I can't sit there and be like, oh, you're talking about me and then pull their IVs out. I mean, I think about it. <laughs> right? You know, oh, remember what you were saying? Maybe I shall squeeze this. What happens if I squeeze this? You know me by now. There are some weird things that go on in my head. But there's been a lot of tears, but I want you to know this. Joy comes in the morning. I, Psalm 35, weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. The Bible tells us that Jesus was a man well acquainted with sorrows and afflicted with many griefs. The, Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. There's lots of people that cried. And go ahead and have your cry. But understand this. God gets the final say. And joy does come in the morning. It's worth it when we understand this. It's you and me, kid. It's you and me. Let's pray. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really?